Sculpting animals was once my childhood pastime, but my adult sculpture background is mostly in horses, and so I'm eager to reconnect and try a realistic wildlife sculpture now, and I can't wait to show you what I made. I think the biggest reason I stopped making animals as a youth was because I struggled with sculpture. I wanted everything to look ultra-realistic, and I hadn't the slightest clue how to get the clay to look like that. As an adult, armatures have come to my rescue. I think a lot of my initial struggle was the lack of a strong base to put my clay onto. When I got into customizing plastic model horses, partial armatures made re-sculpting entirely new sections so much easier and I learned so much about how to construct sturdy supports. I'm using a Google photo of a standing okapi only to ensure that my armature is realistically proportionate. This won't be the look of the final sculpture. Rather, I plan to pose my sculpture into a running okapi. I've learned to always start with the profile of a sculpture and then add some three-dimensional bulk with aluminum foil. With the bulk established, it's a little easier to glue the legs, which I just bent into the pose I want. CA glue and baking soda helps here. To finish, I wrap thin jewelry wire around the neck and leg wire to make it easier for my milliput epoxy putty to stick to later. Doesn't really look like an okapi right now, does it? Looks a little old crappy. I have to remind myself to trust the process. Just trust the process. I'm using milliput in the turquoise color. It's important to mix equal parts for six minutes for the best cure. Even for complex realism sculpting, I like to start by simplifying the sculpting process into basic shapes. Here I'm making circular blobs and noodle shapes for the joints. Those are the technical terms by the way, circles and blobs. I like to start with roughly marking the joints because those are like sculptural landmarks. Get these proportionally right and everything comes together easier. Especially if photorealism is my goal, and it is my goal for this sculpture. The hooves are just blobs for now. I try to remind myself not to worry about perfection at this early stage. I found it easiest to block in flat noodle shapes for the back and belly, and then I let this cure so I won't squish it later. I quickly block in the legs and neck, again not worrying about it looking right and rather just making sure I have milliput filling those areas. Next I block in the major bones with, you guessed it, noodle shapes. A clay shaper helps reach those tricky spots. Using reference as my guide, I mark where the eyes will go. This does haunt my dreams. After all of that is cured, I continue adding more bulk with basic shapes and a lot of adjustment.
I rotate the Okapi to see how the forms are looking in relation to each other and that everything looks right for the pose I have planned. For example, her right hind leg is pushed under her belly, so I want to make sure that side of her belly looks pushed out to make room for her leg. I want the other side to look a little stretched. Before that cures, I mark out the edges of the ribs and make that nice, soft transition line you sometimes see on herbivores in their loin area. I continue to block in all the mass, or rather the deep tissue muscles in the shoulders and the butt. Since all of this will get covered with superficial muscles, this needn't be perfect just yet. Even as I film the legs, I'm keeping it loose in style and working quickly. Slightly less okrappy and a little more okapi. Trust the process. Before adding more bulk and surface muscles, I always take a moment to drill a cured epoxy and make sure this base layer looks like how I want it. In this case, I'm really just making sure that the leg bones are properly shaped and not wonky. I use a flex shaft rotary drill with a sanding drum for this as it's fastest, though needle files and sandpaper get the job done as well. And then I start planning out my major muscle groups with a pencil and the guide of anatomical reference materials. Sometimes I skip this step. Actually for my horses I'm confident enough to skip drawing, but since this is a creature I've never sculpted before, I wanted to draw. I find this also helps force me to really look at this animal, especially since it has anatomical similarities to a horse. If I wasn't really paying attention, it might be tempting to sculpt horse anatomy and it might even have them subconsciously. This focused drawing helps me avoid that. Speaking of anatomy, I begin sculpting the surface muscles with noodle shapes, oval shapes, and triangular shapes. Ooh, getting fancy bringing out the triangles. My fingers, a silicone tip clay shaper, and water help refine the shapes, blend, and smooth. Again, I'm rotating the sculpture to see how it looks from all angles. It's such a simple tip and I really wish I would have known it as a kid. This was a tip I was taught later in life and it's to both check for anatomical correctness for realistic sculptures and it's also to check for visual interest for all types of sculptures. Now is the easiest time for me to make those artistic decisions and add to or change my sculpture as needed. I always have art goals, and one of my sculpting goals is to soften my style. My default style is super crisp, defined, bulky muscles, which sometimes is the look I want, but for many animals it's often too defined for a realism style. Smoothing with water and assorted sculpting tools helps, and I'm certainly getting better, yet I find as attractive sculpting method is still my best edit. 
That subtractive process usually comes in the form of drilling after the milliput has cured. My drill is pretty much my best bud now. For me, sculpting is very much a back and forth process of adding and subtracting until I'm finally happy with the results. One side sculpted, now let's use some YouTube magic for the other side. <laughs> if only it was that easy. For the eyes, I use stainless steel ball bearings in assorted sizes. 2.5 millimeter berries look perfect for this I'll copy. I take my time to balance both sides. I will admit this is a little scary, but it just works so well. Now for the tricky part, the head. On paper, this is simple. It's just more blobs and noodles. In practice though, precision is key here. Faces are so recognizable that if I get the shapes too wrong, it will look weird. I take my time and study my references carefully. It's possible it won't be perfect or 100% realistic, and maybe that's okay. I'll take the lessons I learned from the sculptor and apply it to future sculptures. Even in my pursuit of realism sculpture, sometimes the lessons I learn from each attempt are more important than making every one of my sculptures perfect every time. The ears I sculpt in a very similar way to how I've demonstrated sculpting horse ears in previous videos, only now I'm paying close attention to the unique Okapi shape. Off camera, I sculpted the other side of the face, then proceeded to sculpt both sides of the muzzle. I thought maybe I could skip my usual method of drilling a hole to secure my ears into and just set them into a fresh blob of epoxy instead. <laughs> well, that was frustrating. So let's bring out my baking soda and super glue. And you're correct, I do store my crafting baking soda in a recycled ice cream container. Forbidden ice cream. Oh wait, that's gelato. Forbidden gelato. Alright, are you ready for this little fella to stop looking like an alien creature? There we go, much more like an Ogapi now. Adding in the final details will really help me bring her to life. Mm -hmm. 
Different colors of two parts sculpting epoxy putties can behave differently. I've personally found that each color of milliput have different consistencies, which can change the blending and detailing experience. I love the color of turquoise, but it is so soft and the fine little grains of dark green made it tricky to get crisp details. I found that terracotta is firmer and details really easily with the detailing techniques I use, so I first tried blending equal parts of terracotta and turquoise to see if that would help. And it did, but the dark green bit still got in my way at this tiny scale, so I switched to only terracotta for the rest of the details. And that's why she's multicolored. I drilled holes into the head and the detached ear, then inserted some wire to help pin that ear in. I should have used the same method I've always used on my horses, but oh well. Artistic mistakes are wonderful because they teach you how to fix things. Let's sprinkle that gelato. And with that rectified, I can finally sculpt the hooves. Ooh, I'm getting excited to paint her. Speaking of painting, let's get her ready. I use my drill to both blend, smooth, and make final adjustments to her shape. Then I sand all over with the sanding sponge to ensure my primer will have plenty of tooth. A needle file helps me make fine-tuned adjustments I missed with my drill. And then I wash the old copy with dish soap and oops, way too much baking soda. After drip drying, I fill imperfections with Bondo Spot Putty. Since Bondo has a smelly solvent, I work in a well ventilated area and only use what I need. Another bath to make sure I remove any possible residue, especially finger oils that might prevent my primer from sticking. Mounting to a primer cap makes for easier priming. And now I'm ready to grab my Dupacolor Sandable Primer and my Vapor Mask for respiratory protection. That first layer of primer always reveals more unwanted textures, so I repeat the Bondo sanding and washing steps. And with that, I call it the prepping done. I'm on a quest to level up my acrylic painting skills on models, so I set out my golden fluid paints on a wet palette. This keeps my paints hydrated longer and I find that it helps with smooth blending. I'm also finding that starting with colors similar to my primer color also makes it easier to get smooth color transitions. So I start with thin layers of reddish brown, slowly darkening as I add more layers. I'm also on a quest to find my perfect brush for acrylic painting on models. I haven't found it yet, which is why you see me switching brushes so much. Not bad. Now for the markings. I will admit, I was a little nervous about her stripes, so I'm starting with her face first. I paint the legs much like I do for horses with thin layers of warm white paint. For all the markings, that white color is a mix of titanium white, yellow, and burnt sienna. And later, a little bit of burnt umber too for a darker mix. Now, time to stop procrastinating and just paint some stripes.
That wasn't so bad. I did, however, forget to check my references when painting the front legs, so I need to add back in a dark stripe. I made some touch-ups and also painted some dark shadows in her neck folds using a mix of phthalo blue and alizarin crimson hue to mix my own shade of black paint. And lighter browns for highlights. That's looking pretty sweet. I'll just add another layer of white to the stripes. And now I'll let her dry for at least a week before switching to oils for refinement and details. I pick and paint her oil as much as I do with model horses following the same techniques I shared in those videos. Much as with my horses, thin layers and light paint loads are key to a smooth surface. I experiment with a range of red, orange, brown, and yellow colors. I often paint my models in layers, and when I'm using oils, I allow a few days in between coats. I also mix in fast drying mediums like Linquin or Galka to help speed drying times between layers. And now, the moment we've both been waiting for. When I was young, most of my early art was of animals, and surprisingly, not a lot of horses. The model horses came later. Sculpting this little copy, including the frog I already shared here, has unlocked that childhood fascination with so many animals and renewed my drive to make them in miniature form once again. I hope sharing this project sparks a similar passion for model animals, or at the very least, I hope you found it entertaining. And with that, I'll let you get back to your day. Bye!